some critiques of the judiciary characterize courts in some occasions as legislating from the bench. And you've actually had experience uh, in the state legislature, both uh, in the House of Delegates and in the Senate here in Virginia. How do you assess that critique? What, what does it mean to you when people suggest that courts occasionally legislate from the bench? Very few people would suggest that a Virginia court legislates from the bench. Uh, that uh, happens often in the federal system, uh, but uh, our perspective uh, on this particular court is that uh, we are here to interpret uh, the law. Uh, and we are frequently called upon to interpret Virginia statutes because of the fact that Virginia does not have legislative history in the same fashion that Congress has it. So every, uh, every court week we have uh, uh, one or sometimes several cases where we have to determine what did the General Assembly intend. Uh, but our role is never to uh, supersede or to overrule the Virginia General Assembly. Uh, we, we exist under statutory law. So what is it about the court here in the Commonwealth that makes it different? You suggested that that's, there's something about Virginia that makes it different with respect to this question? We are um, well aware uh, that we uh, operate under law and tradition. Uh, the law is the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and the statutes that the General Assembly passes. The tradition is 800 years of English common law and American common law. Uh, and um, that, uh, that is something uh, that every single one of us uh, is aware of uh, those constraints. Very interesting. Justice Mims, let me ask you, um, we've talked a lot about the kinds of cases uh, that the court tends to hear, error correction versus law development. Let me focus on the law development part of the court's docket. Um, are there areas of the law that you think are underdeveloped here at the court that you think the court has not had the opportunity to help interpret, help explain? No. Mm -hmm. We receive petitions to hear more than 2,000 cases a year and every single one of those is, uh, is briefed as it comes into the building, before it comes into the building and uh, then it is analyzed um, by, uh, by members of the court and um, from, that, uh, from that mass of 2,000 plus cases, we choose between 100 and 200 uh, that we will hear fully on the merits uh, with exceptional uh, attorneys uh, and often uh, amicus briefs from uh, other interested parties, uh, which allows us to, uh, to develop the law. Um, to the extent that there is an area of the law which we do not address or rarely address, that would only be because it rarely comes before us. Justice Mims, did you want to respond to either of those points? I, um, I really don't, uh, other than to say that as you listen to the three answers, um, we're not really saying anything that's too terribly different. Um, we take the cases that come to us. Cases don't come to us until there is a dispute out there somewhere in the Commonwealth. We don't anticipate the disputes when they come up to us. We don't go broader than what the dispute requires us to, uh, to address. Consequently, I don't think there's anything that's underdeveloped. So, Justice Mims, when you are on the receiving end of, of this phone call, you're, you're writing a dissent. What's, what's your approach? How do you engage? It's done on a case-specific basis um, because if uh, First of all, you have to decide, am I going to write a dissent? Um, there are many times where I'm, I may have wanted an opinion to come out differently than it did, but, um, but I elect not to write a dissent um, for, for any number of reasons. Um, if, uh, if it's a, um, uh, a case where I am dissenting on a particular issue and, uh, and there is room for further discussion, then, uh, then we will have uh, a very um, substantive discussion about exactly 
where are you and why are you there and what cases support your view in order to uh, um, really to, to be like iron sharpening iron. Uh, and the, the dissent actually can make the majority opinion better. Um, there are other times when, um, when one justice has very strong feelings and elects to write a dissent and is out there by themselves and the other um, six justices respect the fact that there are such strong feelings. But it's pretty clear early on that there's, there really is not room for, uh, for further discussion because it's, uh, you just, you're seeing the world fr through different, uh, different lenses. And there, um, there the majority opinion will often sub salento address the dissent but rarely will it uh, rarely will it address it in a um, uh, in an overt fashion. The um, one point that was made that I think really needs to be underscored is that we have a lot of respect for each other individually. We have a lot of respect for each other intellectually and jurisprudentially, and so we are able to dissent or concur without it appearing that the uh, um, that there is a uh, that a war has broken out in the conference room and that it's spilled over into the onto the printed page not every court has that uh, has that level of, of trust and respect so you said something just now that that I found very interesting uh, if I understood you correctly that you don't always in a majority opinion feel as if you need to respond to the dissent if I understood you correctly and I'm curious about that Exactly. Uh, why why wouldn't that be the case? It's actually pretty rare that you will see one of our opinions uh, respond, uh, specifically say, the dissent has said this and here is why the court disagrees. Um, we, tend to, um, uh, we tend to address it uh, in a more subtle fashion. Uh, your, um, your analysis has been sharpened and has been changed and you are answering one of the one or more of the charges of the dissent, but without specifically saying so. I, I like that, um, uh, that particular uh, rhetorical style because it, it gets away from any hint at, uh, at being personal. Um, uh, when it, uh, I don't think that it, it behooves a court to, uh, to be going back and forth and back and forth with uh, um, the majority opinion said this, the dissent said that. No, the majority opinion said this, and the dissent said that. That's, uh, that doesn't help the development of the law. Justice Mims, let me ask you uh, about oral argument. What do you see as the, the purpose of oral argument? Every member of the court comes into oral argument with the desire to sharpen their thought process. So to some extent, oral argument allows us to do that. But it actually it goes beyond that, uh, and this uh, this um, is something that, that Justice Powell just touched upon. The litigants are there for one reason: they want to win their case, and they they argue uh, very effectively. Um, we have multiple reasons. We want to decide their case fairly and we are trying very hard to do so. But we also have to remember that the opinion that is written by one of the members of the court and then is agreed to by a majority of the court is going to be used in an innumerable number of cases in the future all throughout the Commonwealth. And so we have to make sure that the law that we are being asked to, to um, address <coughs> the issue we're being asked to address can't be looked at only through the lens of those two advocates. So we will frequently use oral argument for purposes of asking hypothetical questions. I'll take their fact pattern and I'll change one fact and I'll ask both of the, um, both of the lawyers to address it with that one fact changed. Because I'm thinking not in terms only of what are we going to do one month from now, I'm thinking in terms of what is a trial, gonna, trial judge going to do 10 years from now. Have you ever been surprised by what a trial judge has done with an opinion 10 years from now? I think we have each at one time or another been surprised at what trial judges have done with our opinions. 
And I think that it goes the opposite way, too. I think trial judges at times are surprised with what we do with uh, their cases. <laughs> that's, the, that's the nature of, uh, of human nature. Um, we are, um, none of us are, um, uh, are perfect. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we all try to do the best we can. Justice Mims, do you have a view on that? I think particularly when the appellee is, uh, is using their time uh, Justice Powell has hit the uh, has hit the nail on the head. The very first thing the appellee needs to do is to respond to the questions that, or the dialogue between the court and the appellant's counsel, uh, because it's clear those are the issues that we're grappling with. And uh, and you know, occasionally, um, one of us will uh, will just simply short circuit the appellee entirely by saying, you know, address this issue first. Uh, and uh, and that's, uh, it really requires some dexterity to be a good appellee's attorney. So what's a, a mistake that an advocate often makes, or maybe a, an inexperienced advocate, a first-time advocate? The one that I always smile over is, uh, uh, two of them actually, one is when you don't recognize the friendly question. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, uh, Lee is right. Lee, will, Lee or Bernard will, will often say, uh, that was a friendly question, counsel. Uh, and, um, uh, and then second of all is uh, when we do ask a hypothetical and the attorney will object and say, but that's not my case. Well, we, we know that's mm -hmm. not your case. That's why we asked it as a hypothetical. But we have to look beyond your case. But um, we, there are some light moments during oral argument. Um, I, uh, I hope that we are not viewed as a hot bench, quote, end quote, because we really are trying to do the best we can. And we have a lot of respect for the attorneys who appear in front of us and the, the occasional pro se um, appellant or appellee who appear in front of us. We, uh, we, we talk in terms of attorneys, but Every now and then, there will be a citizen who will come before us without counsel and will do a very good job. Uh, we all recall one young lady um, arguing a, uh, um, about in-state versus out-of-state tuition who referred to us as you guys instead of your honors. And uh, we actually, I think, all smiled over it because she was not trying to be um, impolite or disrespectful. That was, uh, that was simply her lexicon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, uh, it's an interesting process. So, Justice Mims, do you, uh, do you share the judicial philosophy of minimalism? I think perhaps you do, based on your earlier comments. Yeah, I, I, would, um, I would not emphasize the word minimalism as much as I would emphasize the word incrementalism. Uh, I, um, I respect and agree with what, uh, what Justice Lemons has said. Um, but I think that the incremental approach is, uh, is a hallmark of a, uh, of a thoughtful court. And, um, uh, and so we have to, as I mentioned earlier, we exist within the bounds of law and tradition. And uh, when it comes to interpreting the law, the statutory interpretation, um, we, have to, uh, we have to tread carefully uh, recognizing that we are not to legislate, that our, our job is simply to apply the various rubrics to determine what did the General Assembly intend to say, and then we apply it to that particular case. Um, when it comes to the, the law development on the common law side that Justice Lemons was talking about, um, it should develop incrementally. Um, we, uh, um, we are we are painting on a um, on a um, uh, on a field where where 800 years of judges have come before us, and uh, I don't pretend for an instant that I have uh, that I have the wisdom to uh, to just simply go off in an entirely different direction. Was this a new? Uh or difficult experience for you to get used to, given your previous career experience in both the legislative and executive branches? Sure, absolutely. And um, I, uh, I'm not sure that I have reached a level of competence yet, but uh, I um, 
really appreciate the fact that my colleagues have uh, have um, such experience and uh, and often such patience um, with uh, with having a former legislator on the bench. Um, Can you say a little bit more about that? Well, I I think that. Um, when you look back through, uh, through the Virginia Supreme Court uh, over throughout the 20th century and into the 21st, there have often been former legislators on the bench or former executive officials on the bench. And I believe that, uh, that we bring a, uh, a, a different perspective and an important perspective but we should also, um, as a commonwealth, um, be quite thankful that on a court of seven, uh, there's not seven former legislators. Otherwise, you'd have an entirely different uh, judiciary. Most, <laughs> most of, the, uh, of the individuals who come to the Virginia Supreme Court have been circuit judges uh, in Virginia. Four out of the seven of us uh, were. And um, that is the, uh, the bedrock of experience. The, those of us who came through a, a different route um, are able to contribute uh, um, uh, as well and, and in an important way. But, uh, but all of our cases, with very few exceptions, have come from the circuit courts. And so I particularly have appreciated the, the experience and the knowledge that, uh, that, that those colleagues have brought to me. Justice Mims, what, what do you wish you'd known on the first day you took the bench? You know, let me, um, let me rephrase the question slightly. Um, what didn't I know that, uh, that I quickly learned? And uh, that is the depth of knowledge that each justice has about every case. Um, I had come out of the legislature uh, with 140 members who had to deal with uh, hundreds of issues. And um, on any issue, most of us had, um, uh, had knowledge that was an inch deep. Uh, there was always a few legislators who knew more. And ultimately, they, uh, they, they have a very fine work product most of the time. Um, likewise, when I was at the Office of the Attorney General, there were subject matter experts in every single field, and you just had to make sure that you had the right expert working on the right case. Uh, roughly 200 attorneys and, uh, and handling all of the legal work of the, of the Commonwealth. Um, I got here and found that on every single case, Every single justice had a, a depth of knowledge, which, um, which at first terrified me, and then overwhelmed me, and then uh, gradually I found that I was able to, uh, um, to swim in deeper waters, so to speak. Um, but um, but when, um, when we publish an opinion, um, I, I hope that the litigants and the trial judges and the citizens of the Commonwealth know that it has been as thoroughly vetted and debated and researched and questioned as it's possible to, uh, to do. And Justice Lemons is right. If we can't do that in a seven-week period, then any one of us can say, let's carry this one over. Let's, uh, let's wait a little bit longer and make sure that we've got it right. Uh, and that's, um, that's quite satisfying, but uh, it's also quite exhausting at times.